I'll just give it a couple more minutes to let people dial in. They're all coming in now. Okay, well, we'll get the going in. Okay, uh, thank you to everyone for dialing in tonight. I think this is our fourth state of play of 2021. Um, for those of you dialing in on Zoom, you may see a message about the meeting being recorded, please just click on the continue. That's just a Zoom security feature. Um, so, so tonight we'll be hearing about some uh, research targeted more at the uh, the healthcare end of the research spectrum, rather than the uh, treatment uh, the treatment discovery end of which we've been hearing about uh, in the previous sessions. First, we'll uh, just an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, MND Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aborigine, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. And I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people on whose land I am and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So as I said, we're, um, we're hearing more about research at the healthcare end of the spectrum tonight. So tonight we will first hear from uh, Michelle Farah, who is a paediatric neurolog uh, neurologist from Sydney, and will tell us a bit about MND and children, and also um, some of the, a bit about the decisions that have to be made in their uh, treatment decisions. Um, and second up, we have Jeff Thomas, who wears uh, quite a few hats, uh, two of which are as a president of MND uh, South Australia and also as a project manager for the uh, MindOz partnership. And tonight, Jeff's going to tell us about the, uh, the, this MindOz uh, partnership project. So uh, the format is as previous. Uh, each presenter will talk uh, for 20 minutes. And then after the second presenter, we'll have a joint uh, Q&A session. Um, Please submit your, your questions through the Zoom Q&A or chat function. And similarly, if you're dialing in on Facebook, please um, send your questions using the uh, Facebook chat. So uh, first up, we'll hear from Michelle. So please uh, take it away, Michelle. Good evening and thank you um, for um, inviting me to speak this evening. Um, and it's lovely to join you all remotely. Um, I've just finished a day of homeschooling in Sydney. Um, so it's nice to connect with some adults. Um, and so today I'm talking about um, something that's very important to me um, is working with families and really focusing on patients as the center point of everything we do, um, particularly um, understanding and improve enhancing treatment choice and decision making for motor neuron diseases. Um, so as we would all know tonight, um, having a diagnosis of motor neuron disease is challenging. And throughout the journey, there is not one decision that needs, needs to be made. In fact, there's many decisions and they're all very complex. Um, they range from choosing the type of clinical, clinical intervention. Um, some examples of that may be um, respiratory support, um, being non-invasive or invasive, um, nutritional support and gastrostomy, also managing symptoms, um, supportive care, um, which can also include accessing NDIS equipment and um, therapists and also um, end of life care. But in addition, I think there's much hope and potential to access new therapies and um, one avenue for that, particularly with adults with MND that I'm aware of, is um, involvement in clinical trials for um, experimental um, drugs that are still in development. So um, as um, was said in the introduction, I'm a child neurologist and um, my perspective of motor neuron disease in my clinic is focused on children. And um, this is one of my patients who's a four month old who has MND. Um, you can see his abnormal breathing pattern, which is his respiratory muscle weakness. So as he breathes in, his chest sucks in and his diaphragm blows out. So his tummy goes up. 
Um, at four months, he should be rolling. He should be kicking his legs, putting them in his mouth and putting his hands in his um, face as well. But you can see how paralysed he is and he's really got minimal movements. Um, this is an example of me moving him and it really shows his very weak head control. He's bright and alert. He's got fully normal cognitive function. He can see, he follows his parents around the room with his eyes. Um, and in fact, um, up until recently, um, this was the leading genetic cause of infant death. Um, and from the time of diagnosis to um, the average survival was nine to 10 months and the majority of children had a life expectancy of less than two years. So um, over, I think understanding the cause of different types of motor neuron disease is very important. And this is a timeline of what's happened for pediatric motor neuron diseases and really Wernig Hoffman disease or um, the severe spinal muscular atrophy, which is what the child that I just um, showed you in the videos has. So it was first described clinically in 1891. And I think the full spectrum was described over the next hundred or so years. Um, the standards of care were established in 2007 to have consistent health care around the world. And it was really in 1995 that the um, genetic cause was identified. And over the next eight years, um, the mechanisms of the genetics was further understood from the lab all the way through to animals. And from there, um, that led paved the pathway for therapeutic development. And there were a range of um, therapies and they were all targeting the genetic underpinnings of this condition. And um, the first clinical trials started um, in 2001. And really where we stand today is that there are now three different approved therapies that can improve survival and motor function for this condition. So, um, I think the treatment of motor neuron disease in um, the child neurology clinic has changed very quickly following the development of these new therapies. And these are illustrated in this um, figure. So you can see that they have different way methods of delivery and different dosing regimens ranging from oral um, therapy that's taken on a daily basis to injections into the spine, in the fluid around the spine. Um, and that's done with four loading injections in the first two months. And then there's a maintenance injection on an ongoing basis every four months. And a further therapy is a gene therapy that's given as a single dose once intravenously, you know, followed by pre and post care around this. So um, I think really, I, I thought it was very important um, with clinical trials and new therapies emerging that we didn't have a lot of information about what the expectations were in a wide range of people and what that meant for an individual sitting in front of us in the clinic. And it was really important to understand that and to provide tailored advice to individual families, particularly around choices of what therapy, what disease modifying treatment do I accept or not accept? In addition, um, there's been shifts related to this in terms of proactive care, in terms of management of the weakness of the breathing muscles and the swallowing muscles. So that's really inc increased the complexity of decision-making. And again, it comes back to the point that there is no one decision. There's a whole gamut of them. And while there are treatments now available, um, in paediatric neurology, I think there's always the quest to improve treatments and further participation in clinical trials to explore new trajectories. Um, in addition, I think there's decisions around the rehabilitative care and accessing NDIS. Again, palliative care still has a role 
and the genetics. And the genetics really extends from the individual patient, but also to the family and their decisions that they need to make around reproduction and um, screening of other family members. Um, I think what's been really evident to me is that there are many different perspectives around all these decisions. And importantly, that people who um, can feel very passionately about them and there can be very important differences and that can lead to very important change as well. So really the reason that I wanted to do further research on this is that I thought it was really important to understand the range of factors that influence how patients and families make decisions and to ensure that the medical care that we're providing is aligning with patient and family pers um, perspectives and values and particularly as um, our treatment environment has changed so quickly. So really, I think this change has really prompted discussion and that has really been amongst the medical community, health services and society. And I think there's different discussion points from different perspectives. So on the left, you can see the typical discussions between patients and families that surround decisions for treatment, care, mental health support, lifestyle, financial support and palliative care. Whereas I think from where I sit as a clinician, the discussions that we and the decisions we make are we always want to provide best care. Sometimes it's challenging to balance the burden of treatment with well-being of the family. And if we introduce too many treatments at once, even though they may all be necessary, that can be overwhelming and the timing of the introduction of those can be very important. But also related to the timing is assessing the readiness um, of families and which treatment are we going to recommend? I would say that that has to be shared between people. Um, I think we are responsible for, um, you, for treatment within uh, allocated health um, budget and allocated health um, resources. So that's always um, challenging for clinicians as well. And from a society perspective, um, the discussions are around NDIS and government funding, screening programs, and again, resource allocation, and that being equitable for all patients, which I think we would all agree is very important. So really our study has provided evidence that suggests multiple factors are important in decision-making for treatment. And this is um, one of our first studies that we undertook. And this was, um, the objective was to investigate the factors that do influence healthcare decisions. Um, it was focus groups talking with 25 people and there was a wide range of perspectives, parents of children affected with motor neuron disease, adults, and also healthcare providers. And that was neurologists, respiratory clinicians, palliative care clinicians, and allied health. And really what we found were five key themes related to treatment decisions. I'll go into them in more depth, but they, the key themes were weighing up the possibilities, providing care and support, hope, yearning and searching for information, the value of the community, and maintaining an identity and resilience. So first of all, hope. I think this was universal amongst all people that we talked to and was a major factor in decision-making regarding treatments. But hope was experienced in different ways. There was a possibility of being better, but acknowledging uncertainty, optimism, and the anticipation for a better future. One parent said, oh my God, there's hope. Even if there's no certainty, you just take it. And the adult said, it's getting a bit exciting knowing that there are things on the horizon and it may help. And all express hope for healthcare and technology advances to change the outcomes and the future. And for many, this was the hope that there would be treatments alongside, re alongside choice. And that included reproductive choice. One of the first questions was, could we have known about this sooner? Um, and so that was really, um, important to hear and to hear from our patients. Another parent said, um, we feel like the future is that there will be no more disease. So through carrier testing, you won't need treatments because you can make a choice and eliminate the cruelty. So I think this really illustrates the different perspectives very nicely. 
So secondly, there was extensive yearning and searching for information following a diagnosis. And this was a major determinant in decision-making for all. So parents described the internet being a primary source to fill gaps in information. And adults really more relied on their peers peer groups in the community for information. So one parent said, I hit the internet. I researched to find out as much as possible about the disease, about the options, about potentially what we were facing and the decisions we'd have to make. I guess I cope by going into research mode and doing it as much as possible. An adult said, our pool of knowing people has expanded because of the internet. You can benefit an awful lot in terms of getting ideas and information from other people. So in relation to community and connectedness for patients and family groups, having access to community of people with lived experience influenced their treatment attitudes and decisions. However, some reported community being a place where people can be honest and open about their experience. However, others found that the community could be a place of judgment and pressure. Um, a parent quote related to this was we've been given the impression that if we didn't take the drug, we would not be welcome. And some adults also felt pressure. And this was really to emphasize negative experiences to gain access to therapies. I think this is really important that um, we understand that this is how individuals can feel so that we're aware of this and we can have strategies to overcome it. Another theme was the potential benefits of, and burdens of treatments. So the perceived risks and consequences of treatment were important considerations in making treatment decisions for all groups. You've got to look at quality of life and the freedoms and the independence, but you have that without all the intervention. For many parents and people, function was also an important factor. He's rolling the dice and hoping you will get some benefit. If the drug maintains function that he's got now, he said he'd be happy. Defining treatment goals and burdens alongside understanding uncertainty was important for healthcare professionals. A respiratory physician said, we don't know what we are taking, talking about in terms of length of time we're adding, whether it's one year or three years and potentially adding a huge burden for procedures and therapies. It's hard to know whether we're doing the right thing or not when we're talking in the short term. There's a huge amount of uncertainty about what to expect, that when to even suggest it or not may be appropriate. And that was said by a palliative care physician. The final theme was care and support and patients and families expressed the need for timely coordinated evidence-based care and support. This was physical, psychological and practical support in hospitals and community-based services. Um, patients noted barriers, particularly in accessing specialists, the nightmare of navigation, and other patients found community resources inadequate. It's fine going to see an OT or physio, but if they don't have any experience, it's very difficult. For adults, shared decision-making was very important. So 20, 30, 40, 50 years of living with this, you become a pretty good expert. They weren't listening to me. For clinicians, the cost of care and support was also important. They talked about the resources and the money for providing this. So in summary, decision-making is complex. We identified five key themes to influence how patients, families and healthcare professionals make treatment decisions. And understanding these factors is imperative for providing patient-centered care and informing clinical practice and policy moving forward. So taking this forward, um, we did a further study where we wanted to quantify the values for paediatric MND treatments and to understand if these aligned with societal prefer preferences for the allocation of resources. We designed what's called a discrete choice experiment. It's a survey where a hypothetical scenario is described and you can see this on the right. Um, and there's possible treatment options. And given the scenario, respondents asked to indicate whether or not they will accept the treatment offered. And really these questions were developed from the previous interviews. And there were 32 treatment options that were presented. And each person that did the survey was randomly allocated eight. And in total, there were over 1,100 people um, from the general public, clinicians and carers that completed the survey. 
And this figure shows the results of the choices that were done by all the participants together. I'll just walk you through it. So zero is neutral. And on this side, on the right is yes, I will accept it. On this side, no, I won't. So anything that really crosses zero um, is not significant. But it shows that accepting a treatment is increased if it's new compared to usual care. And the probability of accepting a treatment is actually reduced if it's monthly injections into the central nervous system. So that could be into the brain or the spinal cord. Um, and that's compared with um, in a single injection in the same manner. Okay. Um, the probability is of accepting a treatment is increased over this side if um, there is a 40% or a 60% improvement in chance of increasing function compared to no improvement. And um, finally, the probability of accepting a treatment is also increased if it's accompanied by access to psychological support in comparison to support from just friends. So examining potential differences in the combined analysis, we found that parents were more likely to accept treatment than the general population, I think because they're affected. In addition, people who reported severe depressive symptoms were less likely to accept treatment. And that's very important, I think, to be aware of. Um, and those who reported moderate stress and anxiety were more likely to accept treatment. The maximum price that society, so the general public, were willing to pay for a 40 to 60% chance of improvement compared with no chance was between 70,000 to 140,000 for a treatment. In contrast, to accept a treatment that required monthly injections into the brain, people needed to be compensated by $130,000. So in summary, there were strong preferences for different treatments, and these were related to a higher chance of improved functioning. And except for direct brain administration mode did not significantly influence treatment decisions. And treatments with higher costs that were more invasive and had more risks were less accepted. So I'd like to acknowledge MND RIA for their support of our studies the families and clinicians that have participated and my colleagues that also assisted in undertaking these studies. Thank you. Now I'd like to hand over to Jeff Thomas, who's going to present um, his current research and work rela related to MindOz. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michelle, uh, and uh, I'm glad to be here and welcome to this webinar. Uh, I come to this with a lived experience in that I lost my wife to MND uh, about four years ago after caring for her at home for, for four years. And much of what Michelle has said uh, in her area, uh, as uh, those of you who have experienced this thing firsthand uh, will know, relates uh, pretty much uh, across, across the spectrum. Mondoz uh, was formed about four years ago uh, around a project entitled MND, Patient-Centred Care for a Progressive Neurological Disease Evidence-Driven Policy. And it was funded uh, partly by an NH and MRC grant, 800,000 over five years, but that was augmented by, uh, uh, by contributions from uh, uh, MNDRA, um, MNDA, uh, MND and me, uh, MND Western Australia, uh, Amanda, and my own uh, philanthropic uh, trust fund, the Thomas uh, Research, uh, MND Research Fund. The partners are really the main players in this area uh, of research. Uh, I won't go through them all, uh, but they're led by, uh, by Professor Matthew Kiernan from the Brain and Mind Centre in Sydney. They comprise researchers, they comprise people uh, such as myself with lived experience, 
and they comprise um, uh, organisations like the MND Australia, of course, uh, who have a, uh, as its members of various state uh, MND associations. The title, I think, has two important aspects. One is a patient-centred. In other words, it's not about uh, clinical uh, research, lab type research. This is about what can we do to improve the lot of the patient and of the carer. More, I'm pleased to say that more recently, greater emphasis has been placed on the role of the carer, which is important because uh, I think those of us who have been through this thing know that if the carer falls over, it's all over. And uh, so the patient has to go to, a, to a, a hospice or somewhere, something they don't want to do. Because one thing in common is that most patients and their carers prefer to uh, be uh, uh, to, to be at home. The other is evidence-based policy. A lot of policy is developed frequently about uh, uh, various bits and pieces of evidence and how many patients there are and all of this stuff. Uh, that's important, uh, but this project is, is unique in that it has a group within it that is looking at uh, what are the policies that are required in order to improve the lot of uh, patients, carers and the like. There are three themes in this project. The first is called empowering patients and their carers. And this involves the development of a, a patient app uh, or website. It details everything about the patient you know, uh, their medications and preconditions and all of that stuff, which is important when, uh, of course, if you have to relocate or get special care in or whatever, it's all in one place. The most important thing is that it tracks, it allows the patient and the carer to track uh, their, their progress. And it does so not just by hit and miss or how you feel, there's a number of measures which are well established, which are used. But what it allows you to do is to track that and report it to your MND association or to the clinic in real time so that you can get more responsive care than you would otherwise have. Most clinics, of course, you, uh, MND clinics, you get an appointment sort of every three months or so. Now, a lot can happen in this, in this condition, as you know, within three months. So we need something that's more responsive, and this provides it. It provides also that sense of self-management by the patient and the carer, which they prefer to do. They like, they know what's going to happen, but they like to have control over the management on the way through. That app has now been developed and is ready for testing. Uh, we'll be out shortly and we're starting a very soon on a, on a similar process for carers. That, all of that patient data will go into a thing called a patient registry, which will record everything about that patient, about their symptoms, how it's progressed, what medications have been used, et cetera, et cetera. That will provide, in part, a database for research and a very powerful database uh, at that. And it will also provide a database for improving the methods uh, of patient uh, and carer uh, wellbeing management. The second component is the integration of, of data collection in MND. For many years, a thing called Amanda, and I won't go into all the details, have been collecting data from patients through clinics. That has been important, but more recently, there's another uh, component called SALSA out of the University of Queensland, which uh, provides uh, genomic data. It is critical that 
these two databases are brought together and we've done that in what is called a clinical registry. That will be an incredibly powerful information base uh, for research and for MND service providers. So along it, as well as the patient registry, a really uh, almost groundbreaking stuff, certainly for Australia, in providing this data for anybody who's looking to do research into MND. Of course, it is that that, patient, uh, that clinical registry is also about to be tested, proof run. Always around these things, of course, there are a whole heap of ethical issues, uh, governance issues, and we've been able to sort those out so that if anybody wants to use this data, you know, they have to pass the test. You know, what are you going to use it for? You can only use it for those purposes which are approved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because we must maintain the robustness and the integrity of this information. The third area is, as I said before, is uh, uh, integration of evidence to inform policy. There is a lot of policy around, but what we need to do is to provide better data in terms of better information in terms of MND health and care so that we can provide the highest quality and equitable care that we can. Like most areas of health, you know, we have differences in, in the equity in terms of availability uh, of services. And it's not just regional and remote uh, people, it's people in some of the, even the metropolitan areas have difficulty in accessing services. What patients tell us, carers tell us, is that that uh, information, that service delivery must be integrated. They don't want to be going off to see one person for one thing and another person for something else and trying to get information on the internet for something else. They want an integrated service and that's what we're, we're uh, certainly, the state associations are certainly providing that. And what we'll be doing with this project is to inform that and how we can do better. We also need uniform national policies, as I say, which are patient-centered. They're multidisciplinary in the way in which they provide care. And of course, the we need, we need to be able to provide for collaboration in research and service provision, not only nationally, but internationally. While we're busy working our way here, of course, other people, particularly in the UK and in the US, are doing similar things. And part of our process is to make sure we have access to those so we're not reinventing the wheel. We need to be able to, when we're developing policy and whether it's going to government or it might be going to industry or it might be going to philanthropic people, we need to be accurate in what we say and precise in what we're asking for and what the outcomes of such an investment would be. And that's the process that, that, we're, going, that we're going through. We have a group form to develop this. I think it's one of the few groups around that is uh, that is doing this, uh, certainly in MND. Uh, we're linking it to current projects. We're bringing all of those together and uh, have identified a number of key issues uh, which we're now, which we're now uh, working on. Where to from here? It is, this project finishes in about 12 months, uh, and it's, inc it's incredibly important that we extend its life beyond that. Because just to take for argument's sake, the patient and clinic registries, we need time to market that, to market the benefits, uh, to engage researchers, to use that information for the benefit of better, re better research. Uh, and all of this takes time, We've achieved a great deal in the, in the three and a half, four years 
uh, that we've been going, which was sort of from a standing start. Uh, and uh, we're quite proud of that. We need to look at continuing the group, hopefully expanding the group, uh, improving its governance, uh, and uh, so that it's secure uh, into the future. Thank you. Over to you, Geffen. Beaming thank Geffen. You. Yes, I'm coming right on. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you to Michelle as well. It's great to hear about um, uh, some of the research that's going on that's really uh, targeting that, uh, the, the healthcare end of the spectrum. And you can see it's direct relevance or immediate relevance to our, to our community. So we've got a few questions uh, coming up here. Um, first one uh, for Michelle. Um, do you think the NDIS has been a benefit or a burden to patients with the MND? And what do you think could work better with the NDIS therapies, physical aid, speed of processing patients, et cetera? Bit of a mm. broad reaching question, but obviously you um, can frame it in your own experiences. The answer is yes. Um, I think it has been good for some people, but not good for other people. Um, I think it has worked well for people that are very health literate um, and have support in forming their package and are able to strongly advocate for that package. Um, for other families that are completely overwhelmed by a diagnosis um, and really struggling day to day um, with less experience, um, there's been, um, I guess, I only have anecdotes to say there's been significant delays in getting NDIS and a gap in care. So I think what that means is that there is a potential lack of equity, but I don't have the evidence for that. I think as a community, what can we do is support health literacy for accessing NDIS and um really working with families to ensure that. And I think the role of a um, community organisation is pivotal in the links for that as well. Um, what was the second part of the question? Michelle, Michelle before, you, before you go on with that, what uh, services do the MND associations provide in this area? The reason I ask is, of course, that... Uh, apart from this whole area of health literacy being part of the MindOz project now, we recognise that as being a major issue. Finding your way through the system is a trick. Uh, uh, but in the case of the, associ the associations, help people through that and establishing the package and what needs to be done. Now, are you saying that that doesn't apply in the case of paediatric MND? Sorry, say that last bit again. What doesn't apply? Uh, do not the MND associations provide services to your parent clients in the, in the accessing NDIS? I, I think there's a lot of different support groups for rare diseases and different families will access different support groups. Um, some are more focused on provision of support and packages. Um, and I think really what our research has shown is that families, I think they most value connecting with other families with lived experience um, and Facebook and chat rooms. And they spend a lot of time in that. But I mean, that's the feedback we've received that that's been the most valuable for them. But yeah. Your friendship, I, friendship networks and the like are absolutely critical in all of this. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, a question for you, Jeff, is uh, when are these apps going to be available and when can uh, patients uh, and clinics start uploading their data? Uh, good, uh, good question. We're, we're, we're test running it uh, through uh, one, two, three clinics uh, starting that. That work has already, already started. Uh, you've got to get some specific ethics approval and that sort of stuff, Gethin, but, uh, but that's, uh, that is started. We just then will inevitably, you'll need to tweak them a bit. Uh, that, all, that always happens. Uh, 
my uh, uh, intention or desire as somebody that's providing a fair bit of support for this project uh, would be availability in about October. Uh, we ought to be able to do that. People say it depends on COVID. I think we're beyond the COVID, uh, uh, the COVID phase. We can test it, tweak them, and uh, I would want them to be available in October. We'd like to do it sooner, but uh, you've got to go through all these processes. There's a whole heaps of hoops and still, uh, steeples to jump, uh, but we'll get there. Then, as I say, we're also now starting on a carer uh, app as well, so that the carer reports on how they're going, the patient reports on how they think the carer is going. And that's important because often, and my wife worried about what uh, how I was going as much as I was worrying about her. Uh, and so all of that is important. And the system doesn't take care, doesn't take uh, cognizance of the uh, the needs of the carer just as much, uh, nearly as much as they do the patient, unfortunately. But that's just a fact of life. Yeah, it's a huge burden on everyone involved. Um, um, next question, this is uh, for Michelle. So uh, one of our uh, attendees is interested in how, the, how do you determine the methodology for a society expectation of cost of treatment, the like the $130,000 value is how oh do you work God. that one out that's an absolute clangor of a question um and i think um how do i determine it is by working with a very diverse group of colleagues who have different expertise so i bring the clinical side to the research and i was fortunate to collaborate with a statistician and a health economist and so we all had different roles but um, the survey for um, had dichotomous answers, yes or no, and you were you were given the scenario, and it was, would you accept this treatment if? And so one of the questions sets was, if it costs X dollars, and we changed the cost, um, fifty thousand, hundred thousand. Um, I think there were other costs. I think we got up to a million dollars. And so we had 1,100 participants um, and each person answered that question with a different set. So then what we were able to do was to put that in the statistical model and do um, the statistician did a, a, some sort of test. I think it was called a probit regression um, and that's how they were able to derive that. Now, what does that mean? Um, and why did we do it is an important question. And it's because when government is looking at funding therapies, they have a, um, I, I think there's different ways they do it, but one of the most known ones, and it's not used for every therapy either, is a cost effectiveness threshold. So it's the cost of a treatment relative to the effectiveness. And the effectiveness is usually the, um, uh, the quality of life years gained by a therapy. That's how the, they base it. Now, in mainstream medications like cholesterol or blood pressure or antibiotics, um, that threshold is traditionally set at less than $50,000. So if we were looking at a new therapy, um, I think my experience of being through this is um, it's th that's not the only thing that matters. And certainly the patient experience and what is meaningful is also listened to. Um, but I think just bringing this number to the table to say, well, actually, in the context of a very rare disease, applying this, this is the number that we all think is quite reasonable and it's actually a lot higher than what um, other people would do and I think the reason is is it's very severe it's got an unmet need no other options and it's a rare disease and really um, I think research and innovation if if we aren't you know I think the wheels can potentially stop if therapies can't be in the clinic and the cost is very important so I think there is a very big discussion um, amongst many 
stakeholders about what is an appropriate cost for different therapies. And I think coming up with this number um, really highlights that um, a $50,000 threshold is not always appropriate for all diseases, particularly rare diseases. That's, and I think the other thing which uh, consistently, Michelle, in the, in the MND area, and I see no reason why it shouldn't apply in your case, is the cost of the burden of care on the parent uh, on the parents absolutely uh, uh, and frequently you know we don't have we don't get a lot of traction because people say well there's only two and a half thousand MND people in Australia you know big deal uh, but it's the nature of the condition and the impact on the carers and the and the and the parents in this situation the impact on their work performance their impact on their quality of life and one of the things that we're trying to do with Mindos is to say that is important. How can we quantify that? Because if you want to look at the cold hard economics and the impact on the economy, I mean, the Deloitte study years ago showed that it, it's enormous, you know, simply because of the disengagement of the people that are looking after the patient, be it a baby or whatever, uh, in terms of their productivity in the workforce. And uh, uh, so uh, just a simple measure of 50,000 or whatever is a, a pretty brutal and an and unacceptable way of going about it in my view. Yeah, I think um, that's especially relevant to the, uh, the prospects of the new treatments that are being developed in MND. Yeah. Uh, that are probably the, 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 the ones most likely to uh, be approved in the near future are the genetic therapies and they are going to be very expensive. So, but it's absolutely vital that we get these into our system, get them approved by the TGA and onto the PBAC as, uh, as fast as possible. Um, well, I, I think that, um, you know, people are asking what is an appropriate price. And I don't think I would say it's priceless, but I mean, that's, I mean, that's, not going to be the answer. So, I mean, more evidence to say that a $50,000 threshold is not appropriate is um, hopefully that's useful. Yes. No, I think that that data, I mean, that's what the government listens to. I mean, they obviously listen to, to patient voices as well, but they also want to see some hard numbers supporting, uh, supporting mm. their arguments. I think it's that combination. And look, uh, we've had some interactions with government recently and that they are, really they are talking about listening a lot more to the patient voice as well which will really help in in discussions like yeah this. i think they definitely are looking at new ways to evaluate um you know supporting therapies and access um it's a hot topic um and really i think the survey was focused on community people without a lived experience and just by being presented with the scenario they're happy to pay more. Yeah. It, you know, it's not just the voice of the people with lived experience. Um, it's people without that who are taxpayers who are contributing, um, you know, and I think their voice and perspective providing that as well. I mean, clearly there's more work to do, but I, this is just one study that hopefully it adds meaning to that. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Well, we have uh, some more questions uh, about the databases now. Um, well, about uh, Mindos. Uh, Jeff, what happens after the, uh, the funding finishes up? Have you got some plans for continuing the project or how to maintain that? Um, yeah, we've got, uh, you know, I've already discussed the plan with you, Gethin. Uh, you know, uh, I'm robbing the bank and you're the driver. Uh, no, we, we're working on that now. Uh, there are a number of avenues that we can use. Uh, some of the databases, of course, will be provided uh, at a fee, but that isn't going to support them down the track. Uh, so we're looking at a number of options. We must keep, particularly for the databases, we must keep that, uh, uh, that alive and, and going. And it's, we're probably looking at uh, another, uh, I would suggest to get it well and truly embedded and adopted by the research community and those that are providing care 
In reality, we're probably looking at about five years, I would think, in, in order to do that, Gethin. But uh, 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 yeah, we're working hard on being very determined, very doggedly at how we can how we can do that that now. But I think we've got going back to what you know the evidence based thing. Uh, we now got we now got a product that we can actually say here it is, and here is the here are the benefits of. Of, of using this, and uh, yeah, in the area that you're talking about, Michelle, you know, things like genetic uh, cures and those sorts of things. I mean, this database, you'll have all that stuff uh, in there, uh, accessible uh, to various people doing research. So, yeah, in answer, yes, we're working on it, Gethin, and we've got to succeed. Yeah. Uh, and just to clarify, when you say fee for access, that is fees to external users such as pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Not, obvi not obviously for patients or clinicians to upload the data into it. Yeah. It's no, for no, external no. people to access. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But if you're applying, if you were applying for a major research project mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, you, you were using the data, uh, you would probably put in there some fee uh, for accessing the data. And that's. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's reasonable. Uh, there's an old saying, Gethin, if you don't pay anything, it's not worth anything. That's right. Um, a question back, uh, another one for Michelle. What percentage of infants with MND like symptoms are due to the specific type you've researched? And how effective are the current treatments we have? Oh, that's great. Um, so 95% of infants would have the specific genetic disorder that I showed the video of and the, you know, the treatments that are available. Um, clearly, um, if they infant or child did not have the, that gene, giving that therapy would not be um, worth it. Um, the, the treatments all have one thing in common. Um, they work best if given early in the disease course. Um, and so the expectations around treatment response really relate to um, how long infants have had the condition. Um, typically by the time an infant is diagnosed clinically, they might've lost 90% of their motor neurons and the horse is bolted, so to speak. Um, in that scenario, the treatment improves survival um, it can also improve motor function. So children can learn to sit um, and improve their breathing and swallowing function or, you know, prevent them from losing that. Um, but in a infant with advanced, um, very advanced disease with low level of function, the expectation would be more guarded. It may stop further deterioration and stabilize the condition. Um, that can be meaningful for some families and for some families that's not what their goals and quality of life are. So I think it's really important to talk to families so that you understand what their goals are, but you're also being very realistic with expectations. Um, but really the holy grail is diagnosis before symptoms start. And now we understand um, what causes it um, and that there are the early identification is important and that treatments make a difference. Um, in New South Wales, we have run a pilot adding this genetic test to the statewide newborn screening heel prick. And um, over the last two years, um, we have identified infants and treated them. And we have shown that um, there is the prospect of normal developmental progress so far for some of most of the treated infants that are treated before they get symptoms. Um, and what we have done is we um, applied for, to the um, national committee um, for newborn screening. And I think it was in May this year the, the Commonwealth Government have recommended the addition of the test to all state newborn screening programs based on that work. What about before birth? Is there any way of, te uh, of, uh, of testing? Uh... Yes, there is. Um, and so I think it really depends. I, I think it's not part of... Um, 
I think this is where health literacy comes in, in um, is important as well, because families planning a pregnancy in the first trimester can actually go to the doctor and think they've been tested for everything, yeah. when in fact they've just had um, an ultrasound or a blood test, and it may only be testing for certain conditions. Um, and so um, you actually have to know what the test is and what it's showing. And so some families where we've made a diagnosis, they've said, oh, no, you're wrong, doctor, because we've had that test. And then you say, well, what test did you have? And it's not the right test. But um, the, if you ask for a test, um, um, there are some commercial tests that can screen for severe conditions like cystic fibrosis, yeah. fragile X. Um, but you need to know to ask for it and you need to be able to pay for it. And then that can give you reproductive choice. So um, what one of my pay, um, families that I listened to um, was very distressed by the misinformation. And really that formed the basis of a research grant called Mackenzie's Mission named after their daughter, where there's actually a national um, research screening program testing couples um, who are planning a pregnancy or in their first trimester of pregnancy for a range of severe genetic conditions to enable reproductive choice, whatever that might be for that couple. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, it's fantastic when you can really see that it's real life-changing, um, yeah, uh, like research just drives these life-changing uh, therapies. And that's um, why I think differences in opinion are important and they should be listened to. And, you know, listening to people tells us what we need to do for research. Yeah. yeah, very much so. Um, there's got time for a couple of more questions now. Uh, this is just a quick clarification that the data that goes into the um, mind Oz is the data from the National Registry, isn't it? The, the, the current National Patient Registry. It, yes, 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 it is. Uh, um, Amanda, the Amanda Collection uh, and the Salsa Collection Genomics uh, Collection uh, will be done through the, through the clinics as they are now, but the, it's the, the two collections that are brought together into the clinical registry and the patient data from the patient registry, which is then put in a form uh, which is readily, uh, readily accessible uh, by those who, well, I get not to put too sharp a point on, are approved by the governance process uh, uh, to use it. And uh, of course, by putting your data, by uh, through the clinic, uh, the patient, of course, uh, has the right of choice as to whether or not they just put their own data or whether they put genetic data or, or whatever. But my, my experience is that most patients uh, uh, take the attitude that, well, there's not much that people can probably do for me at the moment, so surely I can do something for somebody else. Um. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, I think you, you mentioned this uh, in your talk, but uh, have you got plans of combining this data with other similar studies overseas? I mean, there's the, um, the patient, the precision medical program that's run over in the US and yep. other programs, I think, in yep. Europe. Yeah, uh, we're, we're, well aware, we're well aware of those. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and good question. We're well aware of those in the US, uh, the UK, typically in the UK, of course, there's one set in Britain and one set in Scotland. They'd have to be, they'd have to be different, and you probably got one in Wales and Ireland as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, they are available. And yes, uh, the the aim eventually is to have all of this data, almost like an international database, uh, that uh, that can be accessed for the benefit of research, and it can go into subsets like the ones that Michelle's talking about. Yeah, you know, what about what about in infants or babies? There's a subset. So you can pull that stuff out if you're looking at that sort of research or providing services to parents that are, that, that are, that are caring for, uh, for such a person. So yeah, uh, we want it to, to be international uh, just as quickly as we can. And of course we've got international links wherever we can do that. Excellent. Thank you. And we'll just go for the last question to Michelle for the evening, or it's a, maybe a more generic question. But um, 
with the new gene therapy treatments, both in SMA but also in MND coming through, um, will these treatments will they be available for patients who are already diagnosed, or are they sort of purely preventative? I think you sort of uh, already uh, broached that somewhat. Um, I think, I, I mean, I think it, access is difficult, um, but in the paediatric arena, it's available for patients with symptoms and really um, there is the only limitation that we face is um, that the PBS restriction is, um, it cannot be administered if a patient is on permanent um, invasive ventilation. So that would be tracheostomy or a non-invasive ventilation for more than 16 hours a day. And I think the basis of that is that there was no evidence that it had an impact or changed strength or outcome in that situation. But otherwise, um, symptomatic children are able to access the treatment. Um, and I mean, I think it's important. There's a huge unmet need for adults with MND as well um, yeah, yeah. across the board. Right. And I, I think all the clinical trials that are coming um, in the adult MND are focused on symptomatic patients. So that should be the population and where the evidence is. And if there's evidence they work in that population, um, you'd hope that that is considered very seriously. Mm. I'm certainly uh, aware of for the uh, the Tofferson trials at the moment targeting the SOD1 mutations that the current trials are targeting patients with symptoms, fast progressors. But I know also that Biogen have just announced a new trial where they're going to target patients that have been diagnosed, have the gene mutation, but have not yet started to uh, progress rapidly in their disease. So. I think um, hopefully those therapies may well be available in um, in both as a as a preventative uh, treatment as well as a as a treatment. We can yeah. only hope that those trials prove successful. I think one of the um, things that um, I've realised is important related to that question is biomarkers. So they're tests that we can do that are a measure of disease activity. So um, they are very important if they're um, robust and, you know, the research supports them in um, supporting access. So for pre-symptomatic treatment, um, some of the questions are, well, did it work or not? Like, were you not going to get symptoms for another five years? And should, why are we subjecting this individual for five years of treatment unnecessarily? Um, and so a biomarker that is predictive of symptom onset is going to be very important in answering and yep. supporting these decisions. And of course, and of course, we've got a lot of those biomarkers in the eight or nine percent of familial form of uh, uh, of, uh, of, of MND, and and that's done just the sort of thing that you're talking about. Yeah, it's tough. We know that, but it gives people the choice in terms of having a future family uh, or whatever. And, uh, you know, is one of the ways in which that form of MND, you know, will eventually be declined, hopefully. And, uh, uh, you know, but that's been done through the biomarker work, which is, you know, quite brilliant stuff. Okay. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, that's been a fascinating discussion tonight and uh, really interesting to hear about all the different options around treatment and what's going to happen in the future. Um, I've just seen out. the comment about terrific except for the flag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't go to, we won't go there with football. Um, Right, so everyone who's dialed in tonight, thank you. And everyone will receive a link to the recording so you can either watch it again or please send it around to your uh, your uh, your connections and your, your families. Uh, uh, and it will be up on our uh, YouTube page for people to rewatch. So um, good night. Uh, we'll you. be doing good another night. session in August. And uh, please come back and uh, tune in again. So thank you. Thank you both. And thank you to our audience. And good night. Bye-bye. Night.